everybody's welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Just as a heads up, we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 8. So if you want to turn there, I think it's page 1086, 87, 88, something like that. Uh, you can look there and get, just kind of get yourself rolling. Uh, but before that, just uh, as I always love just asking a question, just to kind of pull the audience, and obviously it's for a purpose. But how many people know the Holy Trinity? Yeah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. How many people know the Holy Trinity of beverages at any church you go to? Coffee? Tea? Lemonade. Yeah, there you go. That's, I love it. I love it. So coffee, tea, and lemonade. How many people enjoy lemonade? Raise your hand. You like lemonade? I like lemonade. You know it makes really good lemonade? Not to plug them. They're not going to give us free stuff because they're not tuning in. But uh, Chick-fil-A makes good lemonade. And they have the sugar-free version too, which is like, I didn't realize that. Because i got to watch the sugars. But anyway. So how many have ever heard the statement making lemonade out of lemons? And lastly, how many of you ever actually had to do that? How many of you actually, actually really had to, in your life, like for real, take the lemons of life? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so you've actually made the lemonade. Thank you, Larissa. Work alone. Okay. No, uh, no, <laughs> good. No, um, to actually, so seriously, to, to really, to take the lemons in life and turn them into something that, that's enjoyable or, or better or a better story, repurpose. And as I thought about that, I thought about simple examples just in my life, just simple versions of things where it didn't go the way I wanted and I have to, had to make something good out of it. One was cooking and I had, was preparing a nice dish. There was expensive items in the dish and I used a pepper, black pepper canister and have you ever seen a black pepper canister that you get Giant Eagle or something like that? They got three options. You got your sprinkle, you've got your the world is over, the whole big one, and just well, who would ever use that? And then you have like the medium pour. And so if you don't put your finger over the two big pours for the sprinkle, disastrous things can happen. And so I was preparing it, and it was great, tasting as I went, the sauce tastes wonderful. Did this with the pepper and Armageddon of pepper on this expensive dish. And so normally you'd just be like, oh, oh well, whatever. But I'm thinking, I, you know, I spent good money on what this is. I'm going to figure this out. And so just try to repurpose it what I could. It was extra spicy and I just called it black and Cajun. That's what I did. And I think it was good. <laughs> Another example was in high school. I took accounting and in this uh, accounting class, the whole semester long, there was a project where you had to go through all the invoices of a mock business. And so you were supposed to work on this day in and day out for the entire semester and so that your life would not be stressful. I did not do that. I waited the night before to start and it was this big spreadsheet and went through it all and by the end of the night, three o'clock in the morning, my company was down $500 and I didn't know where that was. So making lemonade out of lemons, I brought that in to the teacher and I said, hey, my company is at a loss of 500. We're just gonna have to write that off. And he laughed, and gave me a C. And so the, <laughs> the last one was, same story, high school, science fair. Have you ever done a science fair project, anybody? You know, and they make, they make display boards, like, like legit display boards for your science fair project. I didn't know this. I didn't know this. I was lazy as a kid. And so waited till night before <laughs> to do that science fair project. Went to Staples, bought two flimsy posters that don't stand up on their own. And I decided in one night I was going to test the hypothesis of how mold grows on bread. <laughs> Did you know that mold doesn't grow on bread overnight no matter what you do with that? So I stapled all the bread to the board in baggies, Ziploc baggies, and hand wrote with marker what each one was and what I had done to the bread to try to make mold grow. And they're all fresh. They all look white, white as snow. Everything's great. <laughs> And I prop up my poster boards in this sea of everyone who has these displays. They've printed things out on their computer, all the things. And here I come in looking like the Clampets with a, with a, a stool, four-legged stool. And I propped them up and there it was. And my teacher came around and he looked at it and he looked at me. And I said, so new discovery, fun fact, uh, mold doesn't grow on bread overnight. That's what I discovered. And he laughed and he said, see. So... Um, <laughs> Gets degrees. But anyway, so making simple example of making lemonade out of lemons. But there's, we know there's major examples in our lives too. And to be serious, folks in this room, I know, have been handed lemons. 
and I've had to, I've had to make the choice. Is this lemon going to be a lemon, or am I going to decide to try to make this a better story uh, and rely on God and do all the things? And some things that I faced with as a parent is looking at my sweet children, Claire especially, who's the oldest in kindergarten, and experiencing what it means when someone makes fun of you or calls you a name and, and having to like get eye to eye and explain to her, you know, there are things that you can do with that. You know, you don't have to accept the name that's being called to you. And, and it just, and there's more. And those of you who have older kids, you, you can attest, there are going to be more lemons along the way. But that was the first kind of like, okay, things are getting real now and, and uh, we're molding this child and how to help her out with that. Um, and then even more serious, friends of mine from high school, there are three women actually um, who all experienced the loss of a child. Uh, two of them through anencephaly, which is, um, um, if I'm explaining it right, the, the baby in the womb doesn't either, it doesn't either develop the brain or the heart. It's one of the, one of the organs doesn't, de- the brain doesn't develop fully. And the baby can be fine normally sometimes in the womb. And, and you hear these women's stories and the baby's kicking and, and all the things and, and they chose to take, take, take the baby to term and then they got the gift of an hour or two with this child before the child passed away. And another friend of mine in high school, hers was six months old and dropped her, the baby off at a daycare and they left the baby in the car seat and the, car, and, and the baby passed away in, in its sleep. And so you can imagine that telephone call as she got a call from work to come and, and understand, and so, and it's horrible, and I hate to say lemons because that seems trivial, but the sour notes in, in our story, but these three women used this in their grief and in their sorrow to have ministries for people that have touched hundreds of lives. One of them, uh, she, um, she developed a home for girls in Uganda in the name of her, of her child who was lost to anencephaly. Another one uh, who was a news anchor in Indianapolis now has become a motivational speaker, a Christian motivational speaker to kind of speak to women in groups and things like that about trials and, and moving through that. And it's just amazing how they took that lemon and turned it into something that was, that was fruitful. Since the fall of, God, uh, of man, God has been in the business of making lemonade. God has been in the business of making lemonade in that when, the, when Adam and Eve fell and they were kicked out of Eden, that's a lemon moment, and God turned that around and, and uh, protected them and provided for them and gave them clothes and, and, and sent them on their way. In the Old Testament, there's also this kind of theology, this idea of remnant, Raise your hands if you ever heard that word remnant before in the terms of the Old Testament. And this is how God works. His chosen people, he gave them the law. He said, follow it, you're blessed. Don't follow it, you're cursed. And eventually, of course, they, they transgress against him time and time again. And he turns them over to their sins and to their worship. But he consistently works through a remnant of his chosen people so that his plan of redemption continues on. See, redemption for the Lord is in Jesus Christ where we get everlasting life. And that's not going to be thwarted by anything that human hands can come up with. He's in the business of making lemonade out of of lemons. And this is where we find ourselves in Acts in this morning. We're in chapter 8. We just left this horrific scene of Stephen being killed at the hands of folks who were religious and pious, and God-honoring men. And yet something got dislodged, and they end this man's life. And they're trying like the Dickens to stop this church movement, to stop this fellowship, to stop the pronunciation of Christ as the Messiah. They're going to do whatever they can, and they've, they've named it as that of the devil. And, and they, they end Stephen's life thinking this is going to be it. And then, boom. Boom the church explodes. And we see the fulfillment of Christ's command for the church, which is, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. They tried to stop it, and it just goes the way that it was supposed to go. The lemonade that the Lord makes is happening. And it all started in the Old Testament with Adam and Eve and Abraham and through all the covenant heads leading up to Jesus who came into this world while we were still yet sinners, not knowing what we were doing and calling us to him. 
Every message that I do, mostly, I always try to leave us with some bottom line to remember, a statement to remember, and today's going to be no different. To get that statement, though, I'm not going to go in Acts. I want to go to Genesis, and there's a reason why I'm doing that. Got to stay tuned and stay awake. In Genesis 50, we get the story, the, the final story of Joseph. Joseph, the son of Jacob, who's the son of Isaac, who's the son of Abraham. You track him? And Joseph was an insufferable dude, and, uh, and his, his brothers sold him to slavery because he was favored by Jacob and they were jealous. Now, selling him into slavery, they thought this was going to end Joseph's life, but it doesn't. God uses the circumstance of what's going on and elevates Joseph and gives him dreams to interpret that helped Egypt and Pharaoh out so much so that Joseph had a dream about famine and comes up with the idea of, of saving food so that when the famine hit the land, they can hand that food back out again. And so here at Genesis 50, Jacob has passed away. And the brothers of Joseph come up to him, and they're afraid. They're thinking, he's in this great seat of power, and he's going to retaliate. So they beg for forgiveness. And Joseph looks at them and says, as for you, my brothers, you obviously meant it for evil. The acts that you did against me, they, they were evil. You, there was no goodness in that whatsoever. But God meant it for good took what you did and turned it around for the goodness of the Lord so that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Because that's the whole famine thing. And so what I would say to you, what you, I want you to lock in and remember or write in your journals if you have them, is that the things that we do, the lemons that we produce, are evil. They're not of God. They're sin. They're destructive. And we mean it for evil whether we realize it or not. But God, God means it for good. The goodness of the Lord will triumph over anything that we can concoct by our own hands. So let's dive in and see how this plays out now that Stephen has been killed and we kind of get the, the boom of the church here. Let's see how this, how this kind of comes together. So open your Bibles to Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. And just before we get there, just remember what has happened thus far. Last week, I talked about the beast that's within us all. And what we see here now is that the beast within us all, even religious people aren't exempt. Even religious people can come up with women that God has to work with. Look at how they killed Stephen. Just remember and see the carnal, animalistic, just unchecked, beastly behavior and how they kill him. That's so unbecoming of someone who honors the Lord. So Stephen is now getting ready to be stoned, and he, face shining like an angel, has a prophecy of the one who looks like the Son of Man coming in the clouds. And he's saying a prophecy that comes from Daniel. He's repeating what Jesus said in front of the Sanhedrin. When Jesus was being tried, he, Jesus said the same thing. That's how you'll see me now, as the Son of Man. But instead of listening to it, they purposefully raise their voices to drown him out so that no one can hear him, not themselves or anybody else. And they drag him out, out, into this, uh, out of the city, and they, they get ready. They're throwing stones at him. And he says two lines that Jesus says from the cross, into your hands I commit my spirit, Lord Jesus, and Jesus forgive them. For they know not what they're doing. He's praying for their forgiveness. He's doing the very thing that we're called to do. And they're loud and they're throwing and they end his life so that no one can hear that. Thinking once and for all, we got it. But then we open up Acts chapter 8. It doesn't stop there. The beast is loose. It's, it's, it's the, inner, the inner sinfulness of man is, is being unchecked and doing awful things. Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. And Saul approved, circle approved, of his execution, of Stephen's execution. And that word approved means he was thoroughly pleased. He was joyful. He was happy that Stephen lost his life. Because you see what's happening here? These, the Sanhedrin saw they are thinking they're acting out righteous justice on Stephen, which is like the worst thing. It's the 
most evil thing that we could ever do to somebody else is carry out some sort of justice, some sort of pain or whatever in the name of God. We don't act out God's justice. He does that. But this is what they're thinking. And you think about the course of human history where that has happened, where in the name of the Lord, people have carried out heinous things. And, and you're thinking, I, that's not the Bible I was reading, but okay. But Saul is happy, pleased with his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered, circle scattered, throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. The apostles stayed in Jerusalem for the time being. So we didn't stop at Stephen. That wasn't good enough. And now it becomes real dangerous to be a Christ follower. Because now these men are now, it's not just Stephen, we're coming after any of you all who profess Christ as, a Lord, as your Lord and Savior. And not only are we coming after any of you all, we're going to haul you away. We're going to take you away. As it says here, at the, as it gets to the end here, they, they saw carts off men and women and, and we are led to believe that it's life and death. Like you either profess Jesus or, or, or denounce Jesus as your Lord and Savior or, or you're dying. And how I know that to be true is if you f- go back to Acts t- chapter 26 where Paul is now Paul, like the beacon of hope, light, rain, and sunshine. He is, is giving testimony and and talking about how he has to repent for what he did during the time of Stephen. Acts 26, verse 11, Paul says that, how, how could you not, it's, it's in the idea of how could you not understand how great the grace of Christ is, that even me can receive that. I, who actively persecuted the church and forced believers to blaspheme against the Lord. So he knows very well what he did and, 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 and has that in his life as a Christian that I forced folks to say Jesus is not my Lord and Savior. And in doing that such heinous stuff and voting for people to die, God still can choose me to be who I am today and use me for what he's using me for. See, lemons, lemonade. We mean it for evil and God means it for good. But right now, Saul is not there yet, and he's happy, he's persecuting, and they were all scattered. And that word scattered there means, it's where we get the word diaspora, which means to be dispersed, uh, to, to, to kick out, kind of. But it can also mean, and this is the, the true meaning of God making lemonade out of lemons, it also means just, as the English is there, to be scattered like seeds. So they mean to destroy the church and to stop it. But God says, ah, no, and, and sends these people who are fleeing, sends and scatters them like harvesters who are ready for the harvest and sends them out to Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the world, just as Jesus commanded the church to do. And I want you to see how amazing this is because you need to see the connection between Stephen and Christ. Their deaths are somewhat similar. But when Jesus was struck, when the good shepherd was struck, the sheep did what? They scattered, right? And they scattered, not let me tell everyone about Jesus, they scattered and were afraid. And they hid. They didn't have the Holy Spirit yet. They didn't see how all the dots were going to be crossed, but Stephen did. And so Stephen experiencing the same kind of death, not on a cross, but stoning, but is saying the very same things that Christ did. See that connection. And when Stephen is struck down, the sheep are scattered again. But in this way, they are not scattered and afraid. They are scattered and emboldened with courageous witness. As verse 4 tells us, now Philip went out preaching the gospel. They all went out preaching the gospel. <clears throat> Let me back up. Verse 2, devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him, but Saul was ravaging, it means destroying, shamelessly destroying the church. And entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Verse 4, now those who were scattered went about 
preaching the word. Went about preaching the word. And so they're trying like that, as hard as they can to, to end this. And yet the good news is too good not to share. The title of the sermon is The Goodness of God. See and hear in Philip and, and everyone's actions that the good news of Christ, the redemption found in him, it's too good not to share. Yeah, sure, come at me, bro, but I am going to continue to share and proclaim the good news of Jesus. Do you share and proclaim the good news of Jesus with that same zeal? Do I do that? Not often. I mean, here, obviously in the room, it's safe in here, isn't it? But to do that on a plane, in the grocery store, when my Starbucks coffee is taking way too long to be made, I mean, seriously, it takes too long for Starbucks coffee, but I repent. <laughs> but we now in our church, not just Bethel, but just the church now, and I'm really in America, because there's places where the church is under great persecution and it's thriving because it's, it's a matter of life and death. And they realize that life here is, is it's life, but everlasting life is what's promised, and I'm working towards that. And sometimes our comforts make us a little bit lame and a little bit lazy in our zeal for sharing the word with such fervency of spirit as we see here in Acts. Yet we have the same Holy Spirit. The same one that is working in them is working in us. And so even in our laziness could be seen as a rejection of God, but God will use it for good and he will help us and work us towards his ultimate goal for us as a church. And so now, here's Philip, scattered. Where does Philip go? Look in your Bibles. Where does he go? He goes to Samaria. Raise your hands if you know about Samaria. Raise your hand. Okay. So Samaria, this is of the utmost significance. This is how <laughs> we know God's lemonade is better than Chick-fil-A's, though Chick-fil-A comes in second. So Philip goes to Samaria. Remember, Jesus said in Acts, at the beginning of Acts, to the apostles, you will be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the world. It started in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is rejecting the, the message. Stephen calls them out, you stiff-necked, uncircumcised of heart and, and ears. You are not listening. It explodes now beyond that into the outer regions of Judea. And now Philip is the first recording of it getting out of Jerusalem and Judea. Philip is going to Samaria. We have heard of Samaria before. Who else went to Samaria? Jesus, thank you very much. Jesus in the Gospel of John. And if you go to the Gospel of John, don't have time to do it today, you go to the Gospel of John and you track John chapter 3 and 4, Jesus follows the progression. Chapter 3 is in Jerusalem. The beginning of chapter 4 with John the Baptist, he's in Judea. He leaves Judea and goes to Samaria. He's tracking what he is modeling out what the church is going to do. So he goes to Samaria, and it's unheard of. It's unheard of for him being there. If you were to turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 4, there is a page number for it, and just keep your thumb and ax. He goes to Samaria, and Samaria is kind of like, why are you here? Because you're a Jew, and Jew and Samaria do not mix. Let me give you a little history about this. See, in the Old Testament, after David... There came Solomon. Solomon built the temple, and then some bad things are starting to happen, and there is then a split in the kingdoms. There's a northern kingdom, and there is a southern kingdom. The northern kingdom got 10 of the 12 tribes to go with it. Under the leadership of a man named Jeroboam, who is not in the line of David. And that's important because from the line of David, who are we expecting? Jesus, right? Okay, so this is not in the line of Jesus. This is Jeroboam. Ten of the 12 tribes go with him. The capital of that northern kingdom where they began to set up a temple for worship was uh, basically the region of Samaria. 
The southern kingdom is Judea, and that's Jerusalem, and that's where the temple is for, for worship for there. And so Judea is thinking, we've got the real temple, we've got the real worship, we have no idea who you're worshiping up there in the north. And Jeroboam and the kings after him led the northern kingdom into idol worship, and God handed them over into idol worship, and then finally they were taken over by the Assyrians. And the reason why I bring this up is it then becomes this racial uh, unrest between the two. Because now the northern kingdom is taken over by the Assyrians. There's mixing of theology, mixing of, of worship. There's mixing of, of, of people in terms of procreating and having kids. Now, this is not to say that the Bible stands against interracial marriage. This is to say that back then, countries and races of people was attached to kind of the God that they were worshiping. God doesn't want mixed worship, okay? And so there became this now long history now to Jesus' time in Samaria where Jews and Samaritans had nothing to do with each other because the Jews of the Judean kingdom thought they're idol worshipers. We don't even know who you're worshiping. You're not of the circumcision. You're not of the covenant, not of any of those things. Whereas Samaria is saying, well, no, we have our own house of worship here because guess what? It was started by... Jacob, Jacob, Jacob started this well, and that's who their paternal lineage goes to. So there is a joint history here, and Jews looking down on Samaritans have no business doing that because the southern kingdom eventually was handed over to the Babylonians, and there was mixing of theology and all sorts of stuff there. But because God makes lemonade out of lemons... Through Judea, David comes the Messiah. And he sees that through, does he not? So here comes the Messiah and goes into Samaria as if to say to his own people, Jesus being a Jew, I'm here for Samaria as well. Meets a Samaritan woman. She says, why are you talking to me? Uh, you shouldn't have anything to do with me. And the whole drink from me and you'll never thirst again. And then there's also this line here where she says, our fathers worshiped on this mountain. Verse 20. You say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. And this kind of goes back to what Stephen was saying in his long testimony in chapter 7. That the spirit of the Lord doesn't reside in a house made by men. And Jesus is saying this to the Samaritan woman. I'm here for you too. True worshipers, true of heart. Okay, let's go back to Acts chapter 8. Philip goes to Samaria and proclaims to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. Underline that. When they heard him and saw the signs that he did. Just moments ago with Stephen, and well, not moments, but moments to us. Moments ago with Stephen, he says to the Sanhedrin, you stiff-necked, uncircumcised of heart and ears. You hear and see nothing. And now Philip goes to Samaria, where Jesus has planted seeds already, because the Samaritan woman leaves and tells everyone about the man who knew everything about their life, and multitudes of people came to belief because of that. Jesus stays in Samaria for two days. Scattering and planting seeds. And here comes Philip with the Holy Spirit, with the command of Jesus to go to Samaria and reaps the harvest. Crowds and multitudes hear and see the good news and they come to believe. You have lemonade or lemons, I'll make lemonade out of that, says the Lord. And let's see how this works. Now, the even more profound thing about Samaria is that Samaria, where it was in the northern kingdom, was the home of Ephraim and Manasseh. And you're like, who are these people? You're just bringing up, you're just making up names now. Remember, I started with Joseph, right? So Joseph has relations with an Egyptian woman and has kids 
with that Egyptian woman. So mixed and all the things. And his father Jacob on his deathbed calls Joseph in and says, let me see your sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And Jacob there adopts Ephraim and Manasseh as his own children to receive the blessings from Jacob, from Isaac, from Abraham. Jesus in John chapter 15 talks about how the, the, how people are, the branches that have fallen away are picked up and then grafted back into the root. Not to a branch, but to the root itself. And so in Jacob's blessing of Joseph's, Joseph's children, he is bringing and uniting them back into the root and adopting these two children who would probably be seen as outcasts because of their mixed heritage and grafts them into the root itself. And now we're here in Samaria, their hometown. So what Jesus is saying here with Philip going to Samaria is I've come for the Jews first, Jerusalem, because they're the chosen, and then the greater region of Judea for all the Jews, but also Samaria. You too get to be a part of this as well. So it doesn't matter the transgressions. It doesn't matter the idol worship. It doesn't matter all the sinful things that you have done. If you are a true worshiper, and if you are my children, I'm calling you to me. And then, oh, by the way, Jerusalem, not just these people who have Jewish heritage, but because of your rejection, I'm going to get everybody. This is going to be a whole world thing. And people who are not circumcised and have never heard of me before are going to respond to this great good news in a way that you can't and be grafted in. Isn't that amazing? And you're thinking, okay, so what? Who cares? God's great. You could have just said that in the beginning. What I want you to leave here with is the truth that no matter what you have done in your life, no matter what lemons you have produced, no matter what rejection you've had towards Christ. I mean, his apostle Peter said, I I do not know you three times. And when Jesus was resurrected, he said to Mary, go get my disciples and Peter too. And now on the grander scale, I'm here for the Jews first, and Samaria too, and y'all as well. You can't out the Lord from what he is going to do through you. You, who are lemons, are his lemonade. And you go out of here with that sweet good news to share with other people so that they too, who might be branches on the side, can be grafted in. That's the message for today, and that's the message that I pull out of these simple eight verses. That even though they may not have seen the great picture of Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the world, by these evil acts of killing Stephen and scattering people, God says, don't worry. I got it. You meant it for evil, but I meant it for good. Go and be good. Let's pray. Gracious Lord Jesus, I thank you for this message and this, in some ways, kick in the pants to not just look at Sunday morning as a time to rest in a pew and then just leave, but to be equipped. Remind and convict our hearts, O Lord, by the the zeal of your Holy Spirit, that we have the same Holy Spirit that the apostles and that these early Christians had. And therefore, we can boldly leave here today and and change someone's life by just sharing the goodness that we know in you. And that sharing can be as simple as just being kind and generous, as giving a listening ear to someone who has troubles, or boldly proclaiming the gospel to them when they're ready to hear it. Either way, Lord, use us. Let us be used and not stagnant. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What an amazing grace that we have received. I don't know what lemons are in your life. What 
may have happened in your life that has completely thrown you off course. Or lemons in your life of things that have happened because of your own personal rejection of, of Christ for whatever reason. We're all sinful. We've all, we've all had those moments. But because of the amazing grace and the broken vessels that we are, we can do amazing things with Christ that even the likes of you and me can be used to melt the strongest hearts of stone. Because the message of Christ is that good. And so leave here with that good news. And don't hide it under a bushel, as the song says, but let it shine. Sharing that good news with someone else so that they too can be picked up and grafted in and be a part of the family. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all God's people said, Amen. Go now to love and serve the Lord, everybody. Be safe. Drive safe. Thank you.